Harwell is is uh, not only an educator but an architect, and we'll be seeing uh, some of his, of his architecture this evening. He is a fellow in the American Institute of Architects, and he is a member of CIAM, the Congress uh, International d'Architecture Moderne. He is noted for his contribution, his personal contribution, to the development of the California House. And I think that tonight you'll begin to learn something in addition to this afternoon in the development of the California style. His work was included in the Museum of Modern Art's 1945 selection of the 47 most significant buildings of the preceding decade. And uh, he was in, his work was included in the 1952 selection of the 45 most significant post-war buildings. He is included in the 50 buildings of the last 100 years selected by Architectural Records Jury of Architects and Historians. He was included in the American Institute of Architects 100 Years of Architecture in America, 75 examples from, from 1857 to 1957. His work has been exhibited by the United States State Department, the AIA, the American Federation of Arts, the Museum of Modern Art, the Royal Institute of British Architects, the Royal Victorian Institute of Architects, the New York World's Fair in 1939, the Golden Gate International Exposition in 40, the Triennale in Milan in 1957, the Moscow Fair in 1959, his work has been published in the USA, England, France, Italy, Germany, Switzerland, Sweden, Japan, and Argentina. He currently is senior professor in the School of Architecture, the School of Design at North Carolina State University. He maintains a practice there. He's, he's got many projects underway. He, well, his major project at this point is to design a home for himself, a home and office and uh, he told me that he had to buy a site. He wanted a site 35 feet wide, that he had to buy the property next door, though, so he could turn an automobile around. So he, in order to support the lot next door, he also is adding four apartments uh, to the complex of office and house. We're very happy to have Harwell Harris with us here for, for four lectures this week. Harwell. Sappenfield, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to start with pictures, any talk, extended talk, will be after the pictures, and I hope after questions from you. Um, I'm trying to give some uh, coherence to these four talks by establishing a, a common relationship in the California background, or at least architects who in one way or another can be associated with the California work. My own belief, as I mentioned this afternoon, is that there is a regionalism in California that uh, is not a relic of a dead past, but a uh, foretaste of the future. And only because it happened there first uh, is it important for the rest of the world. Perhaps I'm talking in a time that is already gone, uh, there was a period, certainly, uh, during this century, and particularly the latter part of that half of the half century, that there was a very strong influence 
uh, architectural uh, coming from California. I'm going to start with uh, a house that was designed uh, on the edge of San Francisco Bay on the Berkeley side above the campus of the University of California. Uh, we'll begin with a photograph of the view taken from the site before the house was built. May we begin? Uh, this is not a very good photograph. It's out of focus, but uh, uh, I am using it because it really was made before the house was built. It shows the north end of San Francisco Bay. It shows the Campanile from the University. It shows the stadium. It shows the International House. It shows some of those beautiful clouds that come sailing in across the Golden Gate, which is right down here and which had a great deal to do with the design of this particular building. Next. This is a section through the house. The house was for a bachelor. This was a great advantage because I had only one person to please. Uh, if I were giving this talk properly, and that would mean that I would have only this one house to talk about this evening. I begin with a black piece of paper here, and I will draw a road up here, which seems to be off the slide a bit. And then I will draw the hillside as it comes on down. And then down here, I will draw myself sitting on the bank, looking out at the view. And I would draw the lines from my eyes like this. And what I would see is what you saw on the slide just before. This is what happened. And it, I was so pleased with what I saw from that position that I wanted to make that the essential feature of the house. Uh, the view, I decided, was not simply the bay and the hills separating the bay from, and the Golden Gate, separating it from the ocean beyond, but it was also the sky overhead, and this movement of clouds coming in across the Golden Gate and disappearing overhead, others at a higher level going in another direction. All of these were part of the fascination of the site. Uh, well, uh, uh, we needed a number of things in the house. And one was a badminton court somewhere in the garden that would be protected from the bay breeze. So I decided to put the house between the breeze and the hill. And in doing this, I had to move myself, my mind, out to this position here. <clears throat> and then I drew these sight lines. And I kept uh, the level at this height, so that we would be completely above any houses nearby. One would not even be conscious of their existence. Um, and in doing so, I found myself quite a distance above the ground, far enough, in fact, to put another floor below it. And this is what happened. And then I found that coming down to the ground level, I had room enough to make a sloping ceiling there, too. The sloping ceiling had the advance, advantage that it allowed more sky to come into the view. And for one to see the clouds for a longer period of time as they sailed by overhead. Um, then, because the view was to the west, and it's nice to have sunlight uh, in the house in the morning, particularly on the breakfast table, and since the view to the west, with the sunlight on the uh, red-leaded framework of the Golden Gate Bridge, particularly as it's seen against the blue of the ocean, is another nice feature for breakfast. Uh, I decided to bring in the eastern morning sunlight through uh, glass the back. This time I had a sloping roof here, 
But as the sloping ceiling of the floor below uh, was completed with a flat floor above, so I decided to complete this sloping ceiling with a flat roof above. And then at this point, to kick the ceiling up and put glass in here and let the morning sun come through into the room. I was able, on the lower floor, where there were uh, bedrooms, to do some, a somewhat similar thing. It was a bit easier here because there were no rooms behind. And by kicking this up, the sun could also come in to the bedroom as it looked out to the view and also looked back into a garden uh, closed in on this side by planted terraces and at the very back a high wall that went up far enough to cut off all the view from the street behind. Uh, here, the entrance hall, uh, which is connected to the street by a bridge and by steps, this being the garage here, uh, made it impossible to open up so directly that I could open up above, over the flat roof portion of the entrance hall, the kitchen, uh, a second guest room, a powder room. Then, by projecting the floor out to make a balcony, I not only provided a balcony, but I also provided further uh, screening of the immediate uh, foreground, cutting off view from neighbors uh, within blocks of the spot, but also from within the room, cutting off all visible connection with the ground and giving one very much the sense that this is not a house that belongs to the ground, but one that's in the sky. It's a sky house more than a ground house, just as the view is more a skyscrape than a landscape or a seascape. There are other things that came into this scheme, and I'm not giving these in very good order, I'm afraid, and that was the question of heating. Heating is not a great problem on the West Coast, but one does need heat for a short time, at least in the morning on winter days. And uh, uh, with this plan, which uh, had a great deal of glass, uh, there was about 65 lineal feet of glass here, 11 feet high, and the same amount on the lower floor. And with a stairwell in here, open between the floors, so that warm air would immediately go up the stairway and up to the highest point against the glass, it would be difficult to heat. And so I decided that a radiant system would be the most satisfactory one. This is quite a while ago. This was 1939, and the uh, uh, building department uh, heads were not familiar with it. I had first proposed to use electric cable, a GE cable, used for uh, heating plants in greenhouses, uh, and embed this in channels in the ceiling between the, the plywood panels it would be there. This would fill in the gap between it and be part of the decorative scheme. But my owner objected to this because he had heard stories that electric heating was very expensive. And although I insisted that radiant heating was not the kind that was expensive, still he didn't want to do it. So then I decided that we would use hot air, hot water, uh, is another way that it might have been done, but we would have had to have made floors, if we heated by the floor, of concrete or tile to spread the heat to form a radiating surface from the widely spaced pipes. And so I decided on hot air. Hot air was a very simple thing to handle here because a unit in the basement with a fan could blow air up through a duct and in each floor here in these interior attic spaces uh, uh, another horizontal duct uh, could then become a manifold and hot air could be released in each of the joist spaces here in the ceiling for example uh, 
the air will come up between each of the dry spaces. At this point, um, the uh, uh, plywood and uh, aluminum foil covering on the tops of these joists will stop. The hot air will be released. We cling to the floor and return air ducts on the opposite side then will pull the air across and take it down for reheating. Um, another unit would supply air up here. This would go on up to this point and then would be returned directly for reheating. Uh, no amount of, of uh, <coughs> mass of material would be necessary to distribute the heat because uh, the hot air already was covering the entire ceiling space and therefore it could be done just with an eighth, uh, one eighth inch thickness of asbestos cement board. Uh, this meant that the house could warm quite quickly. Uh, an hour or two hours wait would not be necessary to warm a mass of cement or tile. Also, if we wanted to cool it quickly, and that might be quite important because when the sun comes out, suddenly one has no need for heat. Uh, there was no mass of material to cool and to cool it even more slowly than it warmed. In fact, if we wanted to cool it very rapidly, all we had to do was to run the fan without the heater and purge the system of the hot air. So this became an integral part of the entire scheme. We better go on. I said I wasn't going to talk tonight. Next. This shows the building nearing completion. Uh, the glass is in, uh, the copper edge has been installed on the main roof. It's just ready to go on to the two balcony floors below. As you can see, the building is of redwood. Um, and uh, uh, the next picture, next, taken a number of years later, shows the house after it has after it has had a chance to weather and become um, the less conspicuous part of the hillside. Next, a close-up from below, and I'm giving one a little bit more of how the house really does become a part of the sky as seen from below. It's really only from within that that effect, however, <coughs> is uh, so important. Next, the view from the side showing the profile against the sky showing the nearby houses. Next, a close-up showing these gable ends and how we uh, use the redwood boarding to make a pattern of the gable ends, the railing. Next, a view from the opposite side. This is the north side, a shot made Brown, oh, probably on the longest day of the year when the sun did get around to the north long enough for such a shot. This is the service entrance through here and the service bridge on this side. Here you see the clear story windows that let the morning sunlight into the rooms on the west side. This is the block of the garage. Next. Um, lower down, showing the bridge-like character of the house. Uh, the whole house, uh, this whole portion, of course, becomes a bridge. And then here we see the bottom cord in the bridge that connects the main entrance to the entrance hall. Next. Uh, the street side, the garage, uh, uh, not visible here, but uh, in this uh, six foot overhang and under the roof are uh, wood lattice doors opening 
in behind this wall to a landing. And uh, from that landing, there are steps then leading down to the bridge and into the house. Next. Uh, this is looking down from the bottom of the steps to the remaining portion of the bridge, showing center pivoted glass panels that are used on the windward side, which can be closed uh, when needed and left open at other times. Next. Uh, this is in the living room. Uh, unfortunately, these photographs were made uh, during the early days of the war, uh, beginning with uh, December 7th, 1941, uh, the clear story windows were covered on the inside with black tar paper so the lights would not shine out and tell the Japanese where San Francisco and Berkeley are. And uh, so we have on here only the uh, artificial lights, which are up in that same pocket and which provide night lighting. Next. Uh, this is a view looking out uh, uh, across the balcony, across the north uh, end of the bay, uh, across a portion of the campus. The curtains are pulled all to one side for this photograph. Visible are floodlights are mounted on the posts, which throw light up onto that ten and a half foot wide overhang, and which then reflect light back into the room at night, making it possible to have no lights indoors, to have the curtains uh, uh, drawn aside and to get one's illumination from the outside at the same time seeing the lights uh, in the city below and around the bay and on the Golden Gate Bridge without having to compete with the reflection of one's own lights in the glass as would be true if our lighting were on the interior were on uh, the inside of the glass rather than the outside. Next. Uh, this is stepping out on the balcony, looking in the other direction, looking down over Oakland. This is not smog. This is just early morning fog before the sun had had a chance to disperse it. Next. Um, and this is looking from the entrance hall uh, into the dining room. Uh, up here uh, is the glass again. Uh, it brings in the morning sunlight and the, the view out of the corner. Uh, next. Uh, this is turning from one's previous position, looking at the dining table, uh, to the entrance hall from which we were then uh, previously viewing the realm, uh, showing against this wall uh, uh, four panels carrying a painted map of the world. Uh, looking here into the living realm. Next. And this is the same position, but with the panels opened and showing in the center section a buffet and sliding doors at the back of the buffet pushed into pockets so that the buffet connects them with a counter in the kitchen. Next. Uh, this now is down on the lower floor. Here we are in the badminton court looking into the owner's bedroom, looking across uh, a brick terrace covered by the sloping overhang of the second floor and uh, into the room with the glass rather similar to that on the floor above with an almost equally good view which unfortunately doesn't show here because we are exposing for the interior and not the exterior. Next. 
And this is stepping through that opening into the realm with a view of the uh, desk, bed, and furniture in the realm. Out here at the left, uh, that the very small gable at the lowest level, an inverted gable, uh, is a sun deck. Next. I am now turning on one's heel and looking back through the opening that we looked through formerly from the uh, badminton side. We see the terrace, the badminton court, and the planted terraces. Um, these are now planted to something different, uh, now to uh, Rhynchospermum jasminoides. And at the very top are pine trees, and the pine trees reach clear to the top of the wall behind. Next. Uh, here is the beginning of the bridge. The large plant box cuts off the view as one enters from the street. The louvers cut off what view one might have. Um, on the steps and the sloping walls of the bridge which cut off all view down into the garden below. The other bedroom on the lower floor has a very similar garden uh, without the badminton court but otherwise like it. I believe that is all of this and the others are going to be shorter. This is a much later house. Uh, this is a house for a painter. Uh, fortunately, the house didn't have to be built out of proceeds from the sales of paintings. The owner's father was the founder of U.S. Gypsum. <laughs> the house is made of gypsum products, not to save money, but simply because we like them. And. Uh, they seemed appropriate. I don't have good exterior views of this house. It's a difficult one to photograph, uh, except from a great distance. I do have an aerial shot that was made from a distance of several miles that uh, tells one more about the house than, than uh, any other general shot would be. Next. Now, uh, this is a view of the terrace. Uh, it's a swimming pool terrace outside the living room, which is over here, and then opening off an entrance hall, uh, which runs through the house and comes out at this point. Uh, this is a windbreak. We have we, had, uh, we don't have badminton, but we have bathers to be, to be protected from the breeze here. And uh, uh, this uh, wall uh, was covered with a, uh, an eight-foot wide roof uh, to give it further shelter, make it look like less like a mere windbreak. Uh, and uh, the passage continues on through a door here into a, um, a sort of a crow's nest that cantilevers out over the precipice, which one doesn't suspect is there until he goes through the door. Then a large plant box returns to give some additional protection. Next. Uh, this is that crow's nest that I spoke of. This is the return of the windbreak. The uh, uh, little openings along in here glaze to keep out the wind, but there to allow the view to come through. And from the opposite side of the terrace, one sees this uh, skyline following uh, from opening to opening. Next. A close-up. Uh, this opens through into another garden. Uh, this wall of the living room, which is the south wall, uh, is a blank wall. It has no openings in it. 
The room is uh, used um, uh, as a gallery for paintings, and the lighting comes principally from the top. It has a 15-foot ceiling, but these walls carry up five feet beyond that ceiling line, and we introduce some clear story windows there, uh, which face north and bring light in through uh, a strip of glass in the ceiling, bring it strongly onto the walls, but without <coughs> any sun to fade the paintings. We don't depend upon light coming through low openings and reflected up from the floor onto them. Next. The floor around the pool uh, is heated with hot water pipes below the uh, paving. Uh, hot water pipes in the ceiling above the gypsum board uh, provide radiant heating for the interior of the house. This is early in the morning. There's strong sunlight coming in here, and uh, it looks as though it was before dawn almost on the west side of the house. The contrast in the photograph is rather exaggerated. Next. This is a view looking from the entrance hall door to the terrace. Shows the um, space underneath the overhanging balconies of, of the up, uh, one of, the, of two of the upstairs bedrooms, uh, which is used for dining. Uh, this uh, is heated also by the floor heat. And uh, because uh, we wanted to make this usable throughout the year, uh, we made some large plate glass panels uh, which can roll around on casters uh, and which can be put up to close out the breeze. However, the owner very quickly found that he could also turn these at a different angle when he wanted to bring breeze into the uh, space uh, in the summertime. We made another panel like this. They are quite free to roll any place on the terrace, and despite the breeze, they never have turned over. Next. Uh, the house that you just saw was a 1949 building. We're jumping back here to 1939 in a little house down in Santa Monica Canyon. This was a house that, uh, uh, that uh, was too expensive for the owner when it had only two bedrooms and one bath. So we added a bedroom and bath, and by renting it uh, to the man who recommended me to the client, he was, the client was able to build it. <laughs> uh, the man who recommended me was a writer. This was during the days of the federal what was it called? Federal Art Project. Um, and uh, in all of the 48 states, um, there was a writer's project, which included uh, making guidebooks for each of the states. And the one who was in charge of the architecture for California came in to see me and became so interested in what he saw that he decided that he wanted to have a Harris uh, house. And so he went to a friend of his and persuaded him to build, and then persuaded the friend to add a bedroom and bath for him. And this is how it all came about. This is only about a half a mile from the water. Uh, there's a very nice view from the balcony above. And it's a very small piece of ground and I'm quite pleased with the way in which I handle the landscaping so that one is unaware of the smallness. We can see this better, I think, in a later photo. This is stucco on a wood frame 
forming the vertical walls throughout the house. And this is uh, double-edged redwood siding forming canted uh, walls, uh, which make the edges of the projecting overhangs. Next, a close-up. Here we see the vertical stucco and the canted wood and the large overhang on the second floor, the overhang over the first floor uh, living room windows. Next. Uh, a view in this tiny garden outside the living room. And uh, this shows a bit, I think a later one will show better, how the plant in here screams out the street, which is next to it. And by using the same plants for the screening here, has covered the entire hillside on the other side of the road. Uh, one really thinks that he owns the hillside too. One can't see the fact that they are separated by a road. Next. This is the upper level. Um, and this is the hillside across. Next. And this is from below the balcony from which one gets the very fine view of the beach. Next. This is a, a pre-war, pre-World War II house. It wasn't uh, very pre-war, however. Uh, I remember that because we were using gas for heating, we had to get the foundations in by March 1942, because after that time, no gas would, could be put in a private house. It was all needed in the war uh, industry buildings. This, again, is redwood. In this case, the wood, for the most part, it doesn't show up very well here, is in the form of very narrow horizontal boards, tongue and groove. They were narrow because it was difficult at that time to get seasoned lumber. The shrinkage across grain was very great. In wide boards, such as we had in the first house you saw, 12-inch net boards, the shrinkage might be up to 5 eighths of an inch. So, and that was with uh, kiln-dried lumber, which we could no longer get. So I used these very narrow boards and used heavy battens, 36 inches on center. Uh, the module of the house was 36 inches, and made out of that then uh, panels of a sufficient size to have some weight in the design, and reducing then the uh, narrow boards to simply uh, uh, pattern within the panels. And then, as a relief from all that, we did use some wide boards, some one by tens, which we lapped so that uh, with that uh, inch and a half lap, the shrinkage could be taken care of easily there, and then use copper sleeves to cover the joints and the ends. This is simply the driveway entrance. Uh, happens to be reversed. Uh, this is the garage, and uh, this is a bedroom wing, and this is a part of the roof over the living room, which has a higher ceiling. Next. Uh, this, we've got them all reversed here. I guess I'm the only one that's disturbed by this. This is a view from the lower side. It shows these narrow boards that I spoke of here, not really in the wall of the house, but a wall outside the house. This is a wall that acts as a buttress against horizontal forces. In California, the horizontal forces being earthquake forces. And it's outside the building so that it doesn't cut into the view. The glass here, you see, comes to the very edge of the room. And then this is beyond. And looking uh, 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 the other way, 
um, that one looks only at the narrow edge of the buttress wall. It's no greater than, than a three and a half inch mullion would be. The flat boarding, which was used around the edge of the roof, three boards, occurs again at the floor line here, forming a trellis outside the glass, which comes to the floor, makes it possible for a person to approach the glass without feeling that he's going to fall through it. It also repeats the form of the roof above. And this uh, three board uh, uh, theme carries out again in the parapet wall around the sunken garden. Those boards also appear inside the house, as you will see in a later shot. Two boards appear in the rooms that have only an eight-foot high ceiling, the thickness of the third board being taken up with the construction of the roof. In the living room, all three occur, and then there is more wall and then a roof on top of that. Next. Um, moving around a bit further, we have a nine-foot overhang here over the glass on the south side to cut out the sun, but to avoid making the, the terrace below too dark, we open up the aisle three feet with deep wells, so deep that they keep out the direct rays of the sun, yet let the light through from the sky. The three boards you see here that go through the wall, into the concrete here, reappear here. I happen to like this design for purely technical reasons, probably. Uh, very much as a, music, as a musical composer, I'm sure, would be pleased with certain musical continuities that uh, are a technical triumph to him, and uh, perhaps uh, don't uh, say the same thing to others. But uh, uh, I think of, of uh, this building as uh, the story of the adventures of three boards, because one sees them uh, appearing, disappearing, reappearing in different places, but always having the same character and giving a great deal of movement and variety uh, to the building and yet never letting you forget to, that you're still in the same building. Next. Um, looking up from below, this is the edge of that uh, buttressing wall that I spoke of, the profile of the, um, of the uh, uh, floor trellis. Next. Uh, looking straight up into the overhang, showing the details of the um, trellis. Next. And uh, this the uh, terrace above, taken before things were really complete, before the grass had been planted here. Uh, it's on the edge of a hill, looks out over other hills. Um, it has a very quiet roof line, and, uh, and uh, uh, although it's a very small house, uh, it, uh, uh, seems to me to fit very comfortably on the edge of the hill. Next. Uh, a view looking in from that terrace. Uh, here you see the living room, the same three boards running around uh, the room above doorhead height. Uh, a hemp matting on the floor, uh, Celotex panels on the ceiling, uh, paint, in this case a terracotta uh, used on doors. Uh, the continuity uh, with color is uh, as strong as that with um, the boards. Next. 
Uh, we're jumping now to a house in Texas. Uh, 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 this is a Texas house. <clears throat> um, uh, the idea for this house uh, was developed a considerable time before I found a client for it. All of my Texas, houses, Texas clients wanted California houses. Finally, I had a client who had been a client of mine earlier in California and who had a California house there. And when he moved to Texas, he was the uh, Caterpillar John Deere dealer in the San Joaquin Valley in California. And when he had about uh, used up that market and wanted a bigger one, and Texas seemed the biggest one then available, uh, he came there. I had designed a, an implement building for him in California as well. Uh, uh, he came to me to talk about a house before he even knew what part of Texas he was going to live in. And uh, uh, Texas, by the way, uh, is a little bit unlike California in one respect, uh, and that is uh, it has a climate in many places that uh, is about the worst, I think, that God ever made and one that man can do uh, better. Uh, I thought. And since air conditioning had become the standard thing in Texas at this time, it seemed appropriate to think of air conditioning from the beginning, to think of what advantages one might have if uh, he didn't have to think about uh, catching the prevailing breeze in particular, stringing your houses out in a single line, all at right angles to the prevailing breeze. Uh, that was a restriction that I disliked. Furthermore, I disliked uh, living in a house that was a wind tunnel. And anyway, wind would not uh, really take care of a climate in West Texas where it was the hottest of any place in the summer and the coldest of any place in the winter, and it had three and five day dust storms when one couldn't see the sky at all. An artificial climate couldn't help being better than the natural climate there. So uh, I decided that the garden should be inside the house if it were to be used. And it would be used on these days when uh, the sky is red with dust and uh, the garden would be air-conditioned. Uh, so, this is a very small house. The family, the children had grown by this time, and the house could be much smaller than the California house. So it's built around a garden room. This garden room is air-conditioned. Furthermore, the house uh, was in the country, and uh, unlike most Texas uh, sites, it was next to a small lake. The lake was narrow, but it was quite long, several miles long. And uh, along its edge were live oaks. And uh, well, the house uh, should have a view of the lake, should have some use of the trees, and so it was put near the lake. And because there was considerable slope in the ground over the great distance uh, that the lake was from the highway, uh, the house was going to be quite uh, a bit lower than the highway. We decided that we would plant the property to pecan trees. Uh, so we began with a, a planning module of 33 feet. Uh, this is the distance each direction that uh, they're accustomed to planting pecan trees. We would use an existing piece of driveway that was only about 50 feet long, paved, coming in from the highway. And then at that point, we would uh, 
look up at a 45 degree angle through the line, through the orchard, and as we cut, we would gradually uh, lower our grade. And in doing so, by the time we reached the opposite side of the site where we wanted to enter the motor court, we would be about eight feet below ground. When the pecan trees were grown, one would have no idea that the house was there. He would gradually uh, find himself dropping down between flat sloping walls planted and towered over by trees. And one's first view of the house would be across the entrance court. Uh, lowered this way, the house would be able to look out under the oak trees at the lake. Otherwise, it would be looking into the trees or above the trees. And in that position, one would be more apt to see the houses that I knew eventually would be built on the other side of the lake than one would be to see the lake itself. So this is the entrance. Uh, at the minus eight foot level into the entrance court. Uh, this is a court chair that uh, projects out into the court to allow covered entrance from the car to the house and parking for guests here, garage there. Um, this is a section through it. Next. Uh, this is a plan. Um, uh, this is the uh, garden realm, uh, and around the garden realm, uh, we find uh, off the entrance hall on this side, a service connection through laundry and kitchen into the dining room, and uh, on this side, through a small corridor to bedrooms and bath. Uh, on this side, a uh, small study opening off the garden room, and here the parents' bedroom, dressing room, and bath, which could open both off the bedroom hall and off the study. Uh, the study could be closed off with sliding doors, also the dining room to be closed off and sliding doors. Just in case there were a few days in the year when it would be nice to sit outdoors in non-air conditioned comfort, and we provided here a small porch. On the porch was a fireplace, backing up the fireplace in the study. And then this porch opened into a garden at the back, so we got cross ventilation through there. And the whole thing uh, uh, screened from the outside with glass work. Next. Uh, this is a section. The garden room, as you can see, is a higher ceiling than the rest of the house. And we have top lights that circle the room uh, at the ceiling line. Uh, uh, and the periphery of the room. Uh, the walls continue on up into these wells, and the ceiling is dropped down enough to conceal the top lights, but to let the walls then be flooded with light, wash with daylight, or moonlight as it turned out, uh, and uh, giving one much more the impression of an outdoor uh, court in which the roof was a canvas tarpaulin stretched between the walls, but not quite reaching them, allowing the light to wash down over them. Uh, here again, uh, we use radiant heat. Uh, when we began the design of this house, the owner confessed to something about the earlier house that uh, I hadn't known of before. Uh, that was that in the earlier house where he had air conditioning, it was the first one I had ever put in a building. This was back in 1940, 41. Uh, that, the, that, the that the air conditioning, the cooling, was marvelous, but the heating uh, turned out to be very drafty. 
And so he thought that we ought to have uh, heated floors here. Uh, I thought heated floors would be fine, but I didn't think that chill floors would be adequate for the summer. And I didn't like to put in two different systems. However, we did put in two systems. And it didn't turn out to be expensive. And in the summertime, only the second uh, <clears throat> uh, air system was used. And instead of being warmed, it was chilled. And it made a very excellent system. Next. Um, these pictures were made when the house was barely finished. We had to get something on the banks to hold them until uh, a more permanent growth uh, could be put on. Um, these are before the trees are in. There isn't very much, I'm afraid, to be seen here other than the screening use of the sloping walls. Next. Um, <clears throat> in further, you can see the drive under the overhang and the entrance to the house. Next, <clears throat> the <clears throat> covered walk into the house with the, the trellised outer edge on it beyond the solid port part. The walls, as you can see, are a golden tan brick, and this same brick was used for the walls of the um, garden room. Next. Uh, this is looking from the dining room into the garden room. The floor of the dining room is uh, white marble in three foot squares. The floors of all of the rooms around it, that means throughout the rest of the house, was a Mexican tile, uh, 12 inches net. Uh, I spoke of the brick walls a white plaster ceiling, um, uh, beams that uh, support the ceiling through in one direction, uh, something similar looking in the other direction, contain the, the uh, conductors for rain from the roof to get it off. And then in between this, these little fingers that uh, uh, have no structural purpose, uh, but do give uh, uh, a more interesting connection between the drop ceiling and the wall and help to conceal the, uh, the skylights above. And because they are double and deep, provide a place to put artificial lighting for nighttime use. A small pool here. Uh, which uh, uh, at one time was drained uh, and uh, planted. Uh, when I complained about it, uh, uh, the client told me <coughs> that the sound of the running water in that reminded her of a leaky toilet. <coughs> However, her son was, uh, was uh, strongly in favor of the running water, and it was restored. <clears throat> uh, this shows one of the four registers in this particular room that provide the, uh, the chilled air in the summertime and the tempered air for ventilation in the wintertime. Uh, some of the furniture in this room was furniture that I designed in 1941 for the house in California. These chairs, laminated backwood chairs, were for that house. Um, uh, a coffee table here is for that house. This piece of furniture was designed for this house. Chairs were reupholstered. Coffee table, which in 1941 uh, cost $18 complete, including the lacquering on it, was re-lacquered for this particular new use at a cost of $65, lacquer only. The uh, screen 
Uh, it was a gift from an aunt of the owner. <coughs> Next. Um, another view of the realm. Planting is much more profuse in the room now than it was at this particular time. These were low pot trees along the back. Um, and in the other picture, it was bamboo on the uh, adjacent side of the realm. Um, there are baskets of plants hanging from these uh, uh, fingers in the ceiling. There is a greenhouse outside that is supposed to keep the house supplied with plants so they can be changed at times. Next. Now this is looking uh, from the bedroom hall across the empty pool uh, and past uh, a low clock tree and into the dining room at this end. In this case, it, the doors are only partly open. What one sees through the glass here is the lattice work in the wall of the garden 12 feet beyond the glass. In this picture, it looks as though it were right against it. Next. Uh, this is a view from below. There was a boathouse in the scheme. We made the boathouse uh, very low. Uh, we kept it down almost to the level of the bank and then re-leveled the bank a bit so that the roof of the boathouse became a deck for viewing the lake. We covered it with duck boards and connected it with a path here. Here you see that lattice work in the garden outside the dining room, uh, the garden that also connects with the porch at one end. Next. Uh, um, we're still in Texas. Uh, here again, we have some radiant heat. Everything tonight seems to be radiant heat. Uh, uh, this radiant heat is in a mortuary, not only in a mortuary, in a mausoleum. Uh, the heat isn't for the permanent uh, uh, inhabitants of it, but only for the visitors. And the heat is only under the floors of the corridors and not under the crypts. What you see here uh, uh, is a plan showing the first two units. Uh, in outline only are two succeeding units. Now all four have been built. I have no photographs, however, of the remaining four. I'm eager to get them because having got four of them, we now have not simply the garden that's in the middle of each of these blocks, but we have another garden you see in here, uh, a Greek cross in shape. And the gardens are the things that are most exciting about this mausoleum. Uh, I could talk all night about mausoleums, and I became extremely interested in them and everything else connected with the uh, with, uh, uh, care of the dead. Uh, the, um, uh, I better not start. Anyway, I will say this that my client uh, was new in the business. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, he was eager to learn everything that there was to know about this new business. Uh, he wasn't content to follow grandfather's methods in such matters. He knew about Forest Lawn Memorial Park, uh, with which I was familiar too, and had been extremely scornful when I visited it in 1929 as a member of an engineering class to see the largest welded truss west of the Mississippi. A welded truss was something really to see in those days. The, um, uh, I better not start. Anyway, I will say this, that my client uh, was new in the business. Uh, therefore, uh, he was eager to learn everything that there was to know about this new business. Uh, he wasn't content to follow grandfather's methods in such matters. He knew about Forest Lawn Memorial Park, uh, with which I was familiar too, 
and had been extremely scornful when I visited it in 1929 as a member of an engineering class to see the largest welded truss west of the Mississippi. A welded truss was something really to see in those days because welding was not permitted most places and certainly not in Los Angeles uh, of any uh, important structure. It was all right for Henry Ford to use it for the spokes on his Model A cars, but uh, uh, nothing to trust one's life to in a building. However, Forest Lawn, uh, uh, which was known for other things beside uh, welded trusses even in those days, uh, had a big business, needed to expand its uh, mausoleum, uh, which was very Gothic in character, and it wanted to expand it upward. Um, and to expand it upward, it was necessary to uh, not carry the upper floors that were to be added on the walls and foundations of the existing building. However much they might look as though they were carried that way, they actually had to be carried on columns and on bridges, trusses, which bridged the old building entirely and were concealed under the new skin that went over the whole thing. So this called for 90-foot long trusses carrying, I don't know, probably six or eight uh, tiers of concrete crypts and amounting to quite a bit in weight. And uh, uh, the design having, the architectural design having never been planned for a steel structure, uh, the Gothic openings in it, in their size, shape, and grouping, uh, made the problem extremely difficult for the structural engineers because the openings simply didn't allow um, enough space for the gusset plates that would join the top cord, the bottom cord, and all the interior members that would have to come together at certain spots. There would be no openings left if they did that. The rivets took up too much room in the plates, so we had to give up rivets, or they had to, and resort to welding how much this contributed to the development of uh, safe methods in welding and how much to the business of welding, the progress of welding in architectural circles, I don't know. I do know that uh, when we went out there, we found <clears throat> that every welder had two inspectors inspecting his work. And the two inspectors x-rayed and they also tapped and listened, uh, and they allowed a, a very great safety factor in the design. However, there are lots of other things that I learned that take too long to talk about. I've got to get on with it. But anyway, my new client decided that the proper place to learn about mausoleums was California. Anything to do with the, with the uh, undertaking cemetery mausoleum business. So, um, we got on a plane and we flew to San Diego. In San Diego, we rented a car. Uh, we went to uh, one uh, cemetery that he knew of there, and we learned a lot from that. We came away rather green and uh, queasy, having uh, seen some uh, cosmetology on a corpse that was in pretty bad condition. And then we stopped at every cemetery we saw as we worked ourselves north to Los Angeles and beyond. Uh, of course, the climax of the trip was Forest Lawn. And uh, I really felt uh, uh, quite at home there. This was 1957 instead of 1929, but it all looked very familiar. There was the little church of the flowers, there was the wee kirk of the heather, and all the rest of them. And still Dr. Hubert Eaton, who conceived it all. Well, uh, we walked through um, dozens of mausoleums and down miles and miles of marble-paved corridors marble-lined corridors covered with bronze inscriptions and bronze flower holders off 
not at that time filled with the artificial flowers that can hold them not now, uh, with artificial light for the most part, and after even a few hundred feet of that, uh, there's nothing that one longs for more than anything else than a view of the outdoors, uh, some uh, live people, some live plants, some sunshine, uh, water, anything, uh, almost for relief. Uh, these corridors uh, are lined <coughs> ordinarily on each side with uh, marble-faced crypts uh, stacked six feet high above the floor with one below the floor. And uh, um, to relieve myself, I decided that instead of making a corridor 400 feet long, before we came to an opening, I would take the 400 feet and I would bend it around in a square donut and make four corridors out of it. And I'd put a cork in the middle and I would make an opening into the cork from each uh, corridor. In here we would have grass and trees and, and uh, water for relief. Also, we would top light it. And so we have down each side of the corridor lighting similar with the same prison blocks that we had in the house in Texas. Uh, then uh, we would have tricks opening into the garden. There would be an overhang so that uh, they would be well protected from the weather. Uh, in each of these units we could accommodate about uh, 1,265 crypts I've forgotten how many uh, urns or ashes. Uh, and uh, because we would build uh, uh, a bit at a time, uh, we were planning for a total population here of around 30,000, uh, which would... <clears throat> Fortunately, you know, you don't have to wait till somebody dies. You don't even have to wish that he would die in order to, to provide the space to sell it to him. Uh, all you have to do is to persuade him or uh, his relatives uh, to adopt a before-need plan, invest now and, or buy now and uh, use later. And uh, so uh, this enabled us to, uh, to make complete units. They looked complete. All of the mausoleums that we had visited were always incomplete. The end of the corridor was always boarded up with a temporary closure, waiting until they had money and customers enough to continue it on. Uh, furthermore, these buildings usually began with a very high and dominating central mass with wings moving off of it, and the wings were always out of balance because they were never building on all wings at the same time. Uh, this incompleteness was a further bother to me. I had lots of reasons for not doing all of these things. Here we began with something that we could afford to build now uh, to finance with uh, before need sales and, uh, uh, and go on to another one later. We would connect them with little units here which would also contain crypts. Some of them would contain uh, toilet rooms, flower rooms, and uh, rooms for the machinery used to, to uh, remove trip fronts and to lift caskets to the top level. Um, and then on the outside of these uh, connecting units, as in here, you have other trips facing out into a loggia. Uh, my client was positive that these outdoor units, both in this court and in, these, in, this, and in the big court, uh, would be the last ones to be sold. I was delighted to discover that they were sold out long before the ones inside were sold. And, uh, well, let's go on and look at some more views of it. Uh, this shows the general arrangement of the units. 
of the court in here, which was a fairly good sized court, my client was also worried about. Uh, worried about it both uh, uh, when it rained and when the sun shone, and he wanted glass over it. And I was positive that glass would spoil much of the effect, so we compromised by making a glass roof that moved. It was motorized and it silently uh, moves completely out of sight when one presses the proper uh, button. And uh, here we, sh we see the, uh, the glass roof move back and the light streaming in above. I didn't call attention to the plan to the fact that in the four corners we have what are called family rooms. We also have family rooms. <laughs> Uh, if you want, we can spend the rest of the evening talking about uh, this business. It's very interesting. Anyway, uh, uh, the family rooms, uh, of course, sell for a great deal more money. Uh, in fact, uh, we have a great variety of prices on crypts. We have to because uh, there's such a variety in the size of people's pocketbooks. And uh, one has to have some uh, that one doesn't make much profit on simply because those people exist and they die too and uh, they have to be taken care of and then there are others who have more money than they really need and uh, really their money should I suppose just the way the doctor looks at it should be used to help take care of some of the others who can't afford so much. So uh, there's a hierarchy in the uh, matter of crypts. Now the uh, uh, ordinarily, we have six crypts. When you get above six crypts, it's pretty hard for anyone with normal eyesight to be able to read the inscriptions, the names, very well up there. So we stop at that point. It could go much higher, but it uh, doesn't. And then, uh, because we oftentimes need two crypts for one family when they don't have a family room, uh, we can put one crypt below the floor and reach it through the first crypt above the floor. Well, now the crypt right at the floor level uh, uh, is uh, it's rather low to begin with, and just the idea of lowness is rather repulsive to some people. Also, you sometimes see a person kick it quite by accident, and that's um, very painful. Uh, and then the crypt, those way up at the top are uh, are not very good either. It's just like gallery space, you know, it's skied up there. You think, well, the jury didn't think much of this, but he had to, they had to get it in, so they put it up there. Uh, now, the ones that really bring the high price are the ones that are the third one up. They call those crypts the heart crypts. They're at the heart level. They have names for the others, too, that I won't go into. <laughs> And then they have companionate crypts, you know, the kind side by side with an archway between so that husband and wife and death can hold hands, uh, figuratively speaking. Uh, I don't know how I got off on this. Uh, oh, well, well, let's go on to another photograph. Uh, this is a view uh, in the late days of construction, uh, shows the first unit. Uh, these are the windows in the corner uh, rooms, one in this corner is around the other side, they're arranged in pin wheel fashion, and uh, the uh, the stained glass in them is paid by the owner of the family room. But the family room is wide open above a bronze gate uh, to the full length of the corridor behind it. So the whole corridor really benefits from that stained glass window that the family room pays for. The building in this case is the walls on the exterior are a golden cream uh, shell stone. It's a, a limestone that has actual shells in it. It's a Texas stone and a very handsome one. And uh, the uh, material used for the 
uh, arched openings for the base of the building and the plant uh, containers is a, a cast stone, a warm gray. Next, uh, a detail of the archway. Uh, these top marks in here are shells that are in the stone. The um, cast stone is uh, the only ornament that one finds on the exterior of the building. The arches are quite deep, as you can see. And back in here, in these slots are little three-quarter inch square glazed, gold glazed tile. They give a little bit of sparkle without uh, uh, being apparent as what they are. Next. One th uh, thing that I, story that I might have mentioned and forgot to, is that when the building was up, it was still in rough concrete. Uh, it hadn't really been <coughs> finished at all or closed in, and I was uh, in the court looking at it with the owner, and, uh, and uh, suddenly a thought struck me, and I said, uh, uh, you know, this wouldn't be a bad place to live. And uh, then thinking of my many women clients, uh, I added, and think of all of the storage space one would have. <laughs> Next. 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 Uh, cast stone again was used over the, the uh, uh, stained glass openings in the family rooms. Next. Here one can see the, uh, the shells more clearly than in the earlier ones. Next. Uh, an interior shot. Um, looking down, this is one of the family rooms. The original idea was that uh, we were going to put the stained glass in our cells, but, but uh, money was short, and uh, uh, the management decided that they would uh, let the uh, buyer of each family room pick out his own stained glass and install it. So that was the way it went. This is taken rather early before the bronze gates went in here. Uh, the corridor was further divided, only they don't call them corridors, they call them sanctuaries. It sounds nicer, and as is so often the case now, words really don't mean anything. They're only used for the color they have, and not for any dictionary meaning at all. And the fact that a sanctuary, um, to uh, uh, properly defined, is a place in which there's an altar, uh, just doesn't uh, hold true in this case. Anyway, these sanctuaries are divided uh, further by uh, rock, uh, sort of flat arches at points in the uh, ceiling. They help to further screen the, uh, the uh, um, uh, skylights above. In the panels above this, filling in on it to the ceiling, uh, was space that was intended to be filled with relief sculpture. Of course, we couldn't afford any sculpture to begin with. And then uh, the owner's mother had a friend who was uh, 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 interested in mosaic work. And so she was sending him out from California to do the work when I heard about it. And there's nothing that would be more damaging, it seemed to me, to our design than to have these spaces filled with violent color. Uh, and uh, so I proposed that since we couldn't afford really fine sculptural art, that maybe what we should afford then would be fine literary art. And the fine literary art that I proposed was verses from the Psalms, which would be carved in stone and set up in those spaces. So that was the way it ended up and I was delegated then to select the Psalms, and I selected them largely on account of the number of letters in a verse. <laughs> Next.
next. See, didn't we have this one? Next, next. Um, this is a, a shot in color. Uh, things are still around the wall. The grass isn't very green, and the, the uh, plants here haven't got very far along. Nice blue Texas sky there. Next. Next. Uh, this is another, this is not a mausoleum. Well, this is in Texas also. This does not have radiant heat. It's the <laughs> principal distinction of the uh, This was done a bit before the house that did have radiant heat in it. This house, though, has had considerable additions made to it since that time. It was by far my largest house there, but, uh, but uh, the owner could still afford to add a few more rooms. And when the family was found to be likely to increase its numbers beyond what we had originally planned, uh, I was asked to make some preliminary plans even before the sex of the child was known. And in order to save time, in building the room uh, that would be required, it was suggested that I make two plans. One, if the child was a boy, and another, if it was a girl. And then the father was to call me as soon as the birth had occurred, and I would immediately start working drawings on whichever one was to be used. <laughs> he called me, and fortunately, it was a boy. Fortunately, because it only cost $20,000 to add the room for the boy and would have cost at least thirty if it had been a girl. The reason was that they already had three girls, and uh, if this fourth one was a girl, then we were going to make a court just for the girls, and this would have involved more construction than simply to add another room for the boy. It's true that it really involved two rooms because uh, 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 to reach the second room, we had to turn the first room largely into a corridor, and by this time, they were willing to put uh, more money into more space and other things to, to make them more adequate. And furthermore, the older boy now was interested in electric trains, and it was decided that in order to have an electric train in his room and still be able to use it as a bedroom and a lot of other things too, we would put the train on a table and the table would be hung from the ceiling on four cables and the whole thing would be motorized and it could be pulled up against the ceiling when the room was being used for other purposes. A year later, of course, it was being, the electric train was completely gone. It was up against the ceiling. I don't know what it will be used for again. Uh, the house is uh, a brick house, brick and stucco, rather heavy walls, uh, deep overhangs to cut out the sun, uh, some courts, not air conditioned courts, however. Uh, on the edge of a ravine, although in town, uh, with wide oaks along the ravine and a nice view up and down it. And uh, uh, need for a considerable amount of space and an opportunity to develop uh, uh, a rather large garden. Uh, what we have then is a house with a small court in the middle. Around the court on two sides run corridors glazed on the court side, well lighted, providing circulation in the center of the house, connecting with this very short entrance hall, the entrance hall connecting with a covered passage uh, through doors to the outside and to uh, the uh, motor court. Unfortunately, this drawing 
was uh, made on a large scale, and the border here uh, was made of the uh, rollock uh, bricks, and the lines were so close together that in this uh, great reduction here on the slide, it comes out of the solid line. This is not a wall. Uh, <clears throat> well, then around this court, we have opening on this side, a living room, the living room opening into the small library, the small library opening into the parents' room, bedroom, the parents' bedroom opening through a dressing room into a bathroom. Uh, down this side, this corridor opens into a dining room. The dining room opens out into a court. The court is well screened from the west sun. Uh, artificial lighting is provided across over the court. And uh, the court seems very much simply an outdoor extension of the dining room. At the end of this uh, branch of the uh, corridor is a playroom. This is a children's room with a high ceiling, uh, 12 or 13 foot ceiling, just as the living room is, with clear story windows at each end, and doors opening out onto a terrace. The terrace extended out into a semicircular end with uh, uh, concrete top benches uh, forming the railing around it and giving one at this point a view up and down the ravine. Then down this side are the original children's rooms. Uh, three girls, one, two, three, and a boy. Uh, the kitchen opens off the living room here. It opens with a door into the playroom. It also opens into the playroom through a counter. The doors that you use to close it off and stools so that uh, children can be served there. Um, a baffle and a sliding door forming the, the uh, separation between the uh, kitchen and the dining room. Uh, swinging, squeaking, swinging door, double acting door, not being desired. We were able to make a baffle which uh, screens the kitchen visually, and we had enough of a passage, and by lining it with, with enough sound absorptive material, we could keep the kitchen sounds at a very low level. And with plenty of ventilation in the kitchen, we could keep the odors out of the dining room. The sliding door would perform the separation except during times of serving uh, when the baffle and the fan and the sound absorbing material would take over. The service entrance on through the service yard over here. Then out here, because we cut into the hill a bit, made a sunken garden in here off the uh, terrace from the living room. Uh, we then proceeded to step up with some very low terraces, only two, and I think each one 16 or maybe 24 inches high, to an upper level along here, with little plots in here in which each child uh, could grow something. They usually grew vegetables, but in the spring, the mother grew tulips in them. And then more terraces back here, uh, a potting shed and tool shed in this position, a greenhouse here, and screening the trees and other things for a service yard that, that in which uh, uh, fertilizer, sand, and other things could be kept out of view. Parking space along here. Uh, 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 an arrangement that permitted uh, with uh, doors controlled from within the car to enter the garage without getting out. Uh, the headlights to make sure no one was in the garage before opening the door and closing the door. And then going through an opening in the garage and into the passage behind these doors and on into the house. Uh, 
the mother also requested that the plan be so arranged that the children, when they come in late at night, would have to pass her door. <laughs> so uh, this is her room, this is her door, and they come past here. Then, when they're small, and she happens to be there alone with them, she wanted to have her room and their bedrooms all connected, separated from the rest of the house. So a pair of doors here provided the separation from the rest of the house and allowed the connection through here. Next. Now well, this is a view from the upper terrace uh, looking into the house. It's brick, as you can see. Uh, colors aren't quite true. Uh, this is not quite as white as it appears here. Uh, this uh, sort of high crown hat here that forms the roof uh, takes its form, uh, first of all, from the fact that it's a wood frame house. Uh, brick is used as a facing as a facing for the exterior walls, but to, to avoid having to use steel lintels over the openings, we use stucco over them. The stucco can be on wood frame, it's quite light. Uh, by having a different material over the openings, we can then, out of the same material, provide overhangs, and the overhangs are only where the openings are, not over walls that are blank and have no need of an overhang. So, you see here, uh, the stucco wall above the opening, the overhang here, it's not very clear, maybe clearer than some of the other pictures, uh, right down at the top of the opening where its projection will be most efficient in cutting out the sun's rays. This also provided one other fortunate feature. The husband in this case had the uh, very uh, unarchitectural notion that double hung windows are preferable to other windows because they are more uh, weather tight. Uh, weather tightness is important, but beyond a certain point, uh, it isn't uh, really worth sacrificing much for. And I've always hated this meeting rail in a double hung window that's always right at eye level, it seems, and getting in the way. Uh, but uh, rather than endanger uh, other parts of the design by arguing over this matter, I decided that we could accomplish what he wanted, not with a double hung window, but with a single hung window. In other words, we would take this overhead space here, and since we were moving the framing, the vertical framing for the wall, out a bit in order to uh, give it a little bit of leverage to take care of the overhang, we would use the space behind that and make it a pocket. And in that pocket, we could slide the entire window in one piece, completely out of sight. Also, we could slide our screen completely out of sight. We counterbalanced them. We didn't bother to motorize them in this case. Um, and uh, so we accomplished a number of useful things by this procedure. Next. Uh, this shows the overhang of the living room window a bit better. The plan here is in a rather bad shape at this particular time. Uh, this is an opening on this side out into the terrace. Uh, uh, we not only added a room for another child, but later we increased the size of the living room, which had been made a bit small. Uh, the cost of the house had been a bit more uh, when we uh, took bids than the owner had expected to put in it. Didn't surprise us any. Uh, he could well afford to do it, but didn't want his friends to think that he was so imprudent as to spend more money than was uh, uh, proper from a business standpoint. So uh, we cut it in cost uh, by uh, reducing some things, including the size of the living room. Uh, now, however, uh, uh, having felt that he had satisfied his business associates with his prudence in the original building, he felt free to spend more money now in enlarging it. 
So we took in what was really the nicest garden terrace in the entire house. We eliminated that in order to make an extension to the living room. We now have an L-shaped living room and uh, the, uh, the new leg of the L is a room for dancing. It's a very nice room and it's just too bad that we lost the terrace uh, with its interesting shape in doing so. Next. Uh, this is a view from the living room looking out into that terrace that I was speaking of. <clears throat> Uh, this is the wall along the passage uh, from the motor court. Uh, this is the beginning of a trellis work that extends from this side of the wall out on the other side and covers the uh, guest parking and uh, climbing on this side of the wall in the space that the tension members, which uh, keep that uh, projecting trellis from collapsing on the other side of the wall, hold it down in place, and become a trellis or plants. This is in that particular portion. Uh, in the family, it was customary when each child reached a certain age, I don't remember what it was, probably six, uh, to have its portrait done life-size in bronze. This is one of them. This was the second oldest child uh, sitting there. It was a rather strange effect uh, when all five were done to see them all lined up together because one thought that they were all out of the same litter. But uh, uh, all the same age when their portraits were made. Next. Uh, this is a view looking from that terrace uh, down the walk leading to the upper terrace into the potting shed, past the trellis uh, that supports the overhangs from the other side. <coughs> Next. Um, now we come to uh, uh, a church. Uh, this is more recent. This is um, 19... Well, it was finished in 1963, built 62, 63, designed 61. It's a Unitarian church in Dallas. It's not the complete church. It was the third uh, uh, stage in their building program. It's by a different architect in the first two stages. There were five architects in their membership. I was not a member. That's probably why I got the job. Uh, the architect who designed the first two units left the church uh, after my selection. <laughs> Apparently, they felt it was worth it. Anyway, uh, uh, what we have here is the sanctuary, or auditorium, uh, which I found a bit difficult to do because the earlier architect had planned a completely different shape one from the one that I thought appropriate to Unitarians. His would have been perfectly all right for a Roman or an Anglican church that was highly traditional in character, one that had a processional uh, service that could be extremely narrow and extremely long. There was enough space for a deep chancel and uh, other such things, but not appropriate for this. So I had to struggle within the space that we had, and this meant struggles with the building department, um, to, to get uh, this shape. Uh, it was on a busy corner. There was a, bullet, there was a signal here. The cars uh, made uh, uh, considerable noise as they uh, stopped and as they started again. Uh, the church had been bothered by this for some time. So I had no difficulty in persuading them that the kind of windows we needed in this room were windows in the roof. So we end up with windows very much like the windows in that house in Texas, but for a different reason. Uh, it was sound more than the, than the uh, fierce heat and the dust that we were trying to keep out. 
The windows, however, are considerably larger. Instead of being three feet square, these are 12 feet square, but they go all the way around the room at the periphery, and instead of being up about 16 inches above the bottom of the ceiling, these are up seven feet. Seven feet because our trusses through there are seven feet in depth. Uh, rather than um, make it appear that we were completely indifferent uh, to what people thought of us who only passed on the outside to, uh, to make them uh, uh, not feel insulted, if we're looking for a reason other than a purely aesthetic one, uh, uh, I used ornament, again in this case, a different form, but uh, uh, precast uh, concrete or artificial stone. Um, uh, as a decoration, also for a low wall around the terrace, a columns uh, supporting a loggia, or making a loggia, using uh, a wing formed of uh, a choir room plus three additional classrooms on that level, the classrooms connecting with the two-story educational unit at the far right. Next. Uh, a close-up shows uh, we used uh, stucco on a concrete block for our walls. Uh, uh, the, the stucco having integral color in it, uh, making it uh, warm to contrast with the gray of the stone. Next. Um, looking down this passage, this loggia underneath the choir room and the additional classrooms at the wall, the uh, shadow pattern uh, on top of the, of the uh, artificial stone pattern. Next. I have no interior shots of this building. Uh, uh, the um, building committee and for the church was quite large. Uh, it had a great many members. Its chairman was a very democratic person in his handling of the uh, affairs of the committee. No decisions were made that could not be made unanimously. As a consequence, they were very slow in being made. Uh, um, uh, it was understood when we wrote a contract that, uh, that I would uh, prepare preliminary design. If the design were not satisfactory, I would make another preliminary design. If that were not satisfactory, I would be paid for the preliminary design, and my duties would end, and they would go to someone else. That was entirely satisfactory. But what I didn't understand was that the design had to be accepted, not just for this very large building committee, but it had to be accepted by the entire membership. And the entire membership would vote on it. And it wasn't until uh, I was quite far along and the drawings were, the working drawings were finished, that I discovered that the membership could only vote on it at its annual meeting, which was eight months away. <laughs> by this time, I had already left Dallas I was living in North Carolina. So eight months later, I went back. This was not the working drawings, the preliminary drawings. We had made a very complete model, large scale. The roof came off. All the pews were in place. The, uh, all of the furniture in the chancel was there. Everything was in its true color, uh, uh, landscaped, 
The old existing buildings were in it too. It was very difficult to see how one could make any design uh, clearer before actual building than this one was. But the building committee didn't think that this was clear enough. They wanted to know something more. So they asked me to, t after I had shown them all of this, uh, well now tell us what it's going to look like. Well, what can you do with words? I can tell them that the auditorium was 80 feet by 80 feet, that it was so high, and a few other things of this sort. This was though only if they couldn't read. Uh, what was there that one could put in words that, uh, that wasn't uh, said better already in the drawings? Well, the only thing I des that could be done, I felt, was to describe not the building, but to describe the experience that one would have in the building. So I told them that it was th as though one were walking along a narrow path in a forest. It was rather dark, and the trees were pressing in on each side, <clears throat> and one hurried along, pressed in by the trees and the desire to get out. There was only one way one could go, and that was straight ahead. There was nothing on the sides, and there was nothing to cause one to tarry. So one pushed ahead, and then suddenly one comes to a break in the forest. <clears throat> the path ends, and it opens out into a large cleared space. It's no longer dark, and the uh, light pours down from overhead. Suddenly one comes to a halt. There's no longer any reason to hurry. Uh, uh, it's a place where one can, can tarry. Um, and uh, this was the way I felt uh, uh, this room would be. I wasn't providing very much, a very long path through the forest. It's true that we had uh, <clears throat> um, narthex uh, that uh, uh, had a low ceiling, was comparatively narrow, comparatively long and uh, uh, serve somewhat uh, for this purpose. Uh, but then we had one additional feature. So I said, <clears throat> uh, uh, and the sun pours down overhead, but so that uh, it won't be uncomfortably uh, uh, strong, this sunlight, we station a, a permanent cloud overhead to cut out part of that sun. And then the light pours down over the edge of that cloud, all the way around it, just the way the, the water streams off of the edge of an umbrella. And I've forgotten, I went on with a few other things. And that seemed to satisfy them. In the corners of the room, uh, one was uh, uh, a room for a pastor or a visiting speaker. This was in addition to the pastor's study and opened directly into the chancel. The one on the other side was originally intended as the meditation realm and worked out in considerable detail. And at the last moment, at the um, instance of the uh, decorating committee, the one that had charge of flowers for the uh, chancel, it was turned into a flower room instead. Back here uh, is uh, the uh, narthex and uh, then tunnels at two different points opening into the uh, auditorium uh, uh, under the uh, fire wall, which is in the back. Uh, seeping along the two sides, there were two uh, aisles, not a single central aisle, which bothered the pastor some because he didn't know how he was going to conduct uh, either a marriage or a funeral with two aisles. I didn't see why they couldn't come down one aisle and go back the other. No one would feel slighted that way or felt that he had an inferior seat, and that's the way I think they've done it. Next. Uh, this is a view, a section cut through the other way, looking at the chancel. Uh, these are the... Uh, are the uh, two rooms on the side that I spoke of. Uh, these have become fire exits on the side, the outside, and the arrangement of steps. The sloping floor enabled us to 
keep the floor of the uh, chancel only 12, only 12 inches, only two steps above the uh, floor of the auditorium at its lowest point, which of course is right in front of the chancel. Everyone had a fairly good view this way, and it had the additional advantage of not uh, setting the pastor apart from his flock. It seemed more as though he were one of them. Uh, I avoided uh, anything in the background here that would uh, uh, form a dramatic backdrop that would seem to, to uh, make this more a, th a throne room than simply a clearing in the forest where a stump or a log uh, to raise one a bit above the height of one's fellows so he could be seen by everyone is really all that's required. Next. Uh, this is a plan that should have, really should have come first. Um, shows the, uh, the uh, uh, markers here. Uh, there was an existing chapel over here. Our main entrance was between the existing chapel and the new auditorium. Uh, it was roofed over. We came into an entrance court to an atrium. From the atrium, we came into the narthex. The narthex uh, led the length uh, or the width of the auditorium and opened out on this side into the um, loggia connecting this with the educational unit on the far side, opening this way onto a terrace which could be used as a uh, sort of a gathering place in good weather, and most of the weather there is good, uh, for people uh, between the education unit and the uh, auditorium uh, in view of the street so they could be seen, but not really on uh, uh, The rooms, the uh, women's, uh, a bride's room, dressing room here, the stairs to the balcony, which is only for um, choir, uh, a coat room over here. This was changed a bit. These stairs were taken out later in the coat room was enlarged. A well, part of this was made into an usher's room. Here the speaker's room directly off of the chancel, and here the meditation room, which became the flower room, and then had a stairway leading to the basement. Here the fire exits, well screened from the outside, so if the door were open, light doesn't stream into the rooms. 